Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of Global Political Economy, or GPE News Docs. In this segment, guest Jomo K.S. will be sharing his views on some economic policy and development issues. Jomo K.S. is a prominent Malaysian economist and senior advisor at the Kasana Research Institute. He's a distinguished academic and a veteran diplomat who's held high-level positions at the United Nations Rome and the UN New York headquarters, notably as Assistant Director General for Economic and Social Development of the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, and as Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development at UNDESA in New York. Among numerous uh, other distinctions, he was awarded the Leontief Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought. Welcome, Tomo. Thank you very much, Lynn. At an International Development Economics Associates event, you recently spoke on the topic of U.S. policies that, as you framed it, are driving the world to war and depression. What are some of the key points that you wanted to get across in that public lecture? I think it's in the interests of all people rich in the rich countries as well as developing countries um, to recognize the really existential threats which we face in the world today. And these are are threefold. Uh, We have the long-term problem of sustainability, uh, which, you know, there's much more attention to, especially because of the growing recognition of the the challenges posed by, by global warming. But we have to recognize these two additional problems that of, a, of, an, of an induced de- stagnation and depression, which would set back even further uh, the, the regression which has already begun. As you know from all the data which has been reported on the so-called sustainable development goals, there has been minimal progress on the sustainable development goals and considerable regression. Okay, now this has been variously blamed on, pri- primarily by, on the pandemic, but I would want I would insist on emphasizing the effects of the of the uh, withdrawal from from quantitative easing. I would insist on the role of the Cold War, which began at least a de- almost a decade ago. And I would also insist on recognizing how the sanctions, which are all illegal under the under the UN Charter, all these sanctions have basically reversed um, uh, much of the much of the the some, much of the more benign consequences of globalization. I mean, basically, developing countries have been doubly shortchanged. They were forced into globalization. They were forced into trade liberalization. They were forced into financial liberalization. And precisely after doing so, this very act of opening up on the trade front, on the financial front, and so on, which has resulted in deindustrialization in many countries, which has resulted in lack of food security in many countries, all this has turned against them at a time precisely when those things are, are most needed. So we have a very, very uh, difficult situation, particularly for developing countries. But as we can see, things are not really all that much better in the rich countries themselves. So there has to be a sense of, there has to be an increased sense of how this system works and how it works and affects different people differently, but how this whole system is really interconnected. To deal then with the existential threats we face in the world today, you say we all need to be more aware of how the whole system is interconnected and the effect uh, U.S. policies are having in this system. You've given us a picture of how the workings of this interconnected system has left developing countries in a vulnerable and very difficult situation. Expand more on your point that things are not really all that much better in the rich countries. Let me suggest that um, um, the various developments of the last few decades have been problematic not only for the rest of the world, 
they have been hugely problematic for the U.S. And uh, we, we, we all know about the concentration of power in the U.S. Um, and we also know that, for example, the uh, uh, dozen years or so of uh, what, what is referred to as, as uh, unconventional policies most, uh, most uh, uh, easily associated with something called quantitative easing or QE, uh, that largely did not enhance uh, U.S. productive capacities, uh, did not enhance U.S. ability to lead, uh, to enhance its leadership in a variety of areas of technology. And so what it allowed was for others to catch up. Uh, not only China, which is the, op- the, the, the obsession of the U.S. right now, but also other countries. So what we have right now is that this illusion of prosperity fostered by by what is called financialization has created the impression of wealth, but it is not wealth based on a real economy. And so increasingly what we see is a fight to, to, uh, to obtain, to secure much more wealth through other means, through not through the real economy in the, in the, in the usual sense not, uh, conceived, but through things like uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, and, and, and so on. So who does such income accrue to? It mainly accrues to those who control uh, those rights, uh, those IP uh, intellectual property, uh, which are the corporations, and the corporations uh, are extremely powerful. So I think one has to really think about what has happened to American capitalism itself, um, American industrial capitalism. Look at what happened with uh, with uh, General uh, General Electric. Uh, General Electric was once known as a consumer appliance uh, producing manufacturing company, that arguably the largest in the world. Today, it's known it's a, essentially a financial conglomerate with a historical background in uh, consumer in, in in consumer electrical products. If we look at, for example, what is ha- what happened during the the last decade with QE and uh, you know the the what. what uh, shareholder buybacks and so on and so forth. All these uh, are, are sudden. Undoubtedly, they have enriched a great number of people. Uh, but I think it would it would be a stretch uh, to suggest that uh, the real economy uh, and American uh, technological uh, 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 leadership has been strengthened uh, during this period. In fact, the converse has happened, and this is precisely the crisis which is which is which it faces right now. So it's a it's you know uh, American capitalism is on the decline, not so much because others have overtaken it or are in the process of overtaking it, but because it uh, it 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 uh, deteriorated. And for this, I think we you you know one has to look at the, at national leadership uh, over recent decades and uh, and how uh, who spoke for business, who spoke for capital. Has increasingly moved from the real economy to the to the world of finance. Moving from the problems of induced deep stagnation and depression and long term sustainability issues, talk now about how U.S. policies driving the world to war. I think, uh, as the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and many others who watch this much more closely than than most of us, um, the threat of war is very, very real for a whole variety of reasons many people are, are increasingly familiar with. Uh, but the, the kind of rhetoric, the kind of, uh, of, of uh, behavior which passes for diplomatic behavior, it almost seems as if diplomacy has gone, has taken a back seat. There's, there's no more room for diplomacy. Uh, very often it's not necessarily the generals are pushing for war. It is, uh, you know, what some pe- people in America might refer to as the chicken hawks. Uh, but whatever the case might be, uh, we see uh, a, a huge possibilities. For example, for the for the strengthening of what uh, President Eisenhower re- warned about uh, the military-industrial complex, um, and so the, the possibility of war is is a very real, uh, uh, very real on on. On, for the, on the Western side, on the American side, but it's also very real in, on the part of, the, of Russia. Uh, one has to remember that, that uh, 
in the uh, three years after uh, the end of the Soviet Union, uh, the Russian economy collapsed by half. Okay, collapsed by half. I have to emphasize. It's not you know. Uh, you, I I don't want to finger point and say, and say who was to blame for all this, but it collapsed by half, and it took more than a couple of decades for for the Russians to rebuild the economy. So they are now back at where they were then, okay? And they and and they they have not been in a position to 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 uh, you know to to uh, to acquire a very new uh, military arsenal uh, appropriate for this age. They are in a situation where they are uh, they have the leftovers uh, from the late Soviet period, and that's all they have. And what what was that? That was essentially a period of which, um, which where you know there was a, a, a nuclear uh, race going on to uh, to towards what was called uh, mad mutually assured destruction. Uh, that was the kind of situation. So, so right now, I mean, look at what happens in Ukraine when you when Russia wants to get the uh, uh, um, what do you call it uh, drones, it has to turn to Iran of all countries. To get drones, you know, this is the kind of situ- This is the Russia we are talking about today. So it's not a Russia, you know, and R- Rush- the Russian economy is less than than ten percent of the of the size of the U.S. economy. So it's nowhere near uh, a near parity, but it did come close to parity during the during the Soviet period, and that's that's the arsenal it has. So when you push, when you push Russia. And it doesn't have anything else to count on. It can't even count on China, or, uh, uh, as, as far as some of these things are concerned. But what will it do? It will, it will resort to what it has, which is the nuclear arsenal. And this, I think, is a very, very grave and uh, danger. And that's why the, the pushing and threatening Russia uh, over the last uh, th- three decades or so uh, was a very very dangerous game, and I think I suspect I, I have no proof for this that Putin uh, does not believe that any successor of his uh, will be able to deal with this issue, and he feel he felt obliged to. But one should also remember it wasn't Putin who wanted to 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 go into the eastern part of Ukraine. It was it was the Russian Duma, the Russian Parliament, which which passed the resolution. Uh, de- demanding that 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 Putin do so, so it's a very complex situation which we have been oversimplified into you know into the ogre of uh, of Vladimir Putin, uh, but it's a very very complex and very dangerous situation precisely because we are dealing with caricatures rather than trying to understand how dangerous and and vulnerable the present situation is. So I'm very concerned about war, and that's why I insist on pacifism. And developing countries in general and non-aligned countries in general know that they are not going to be a third force by any stretch of the imagination on the military front. So they have a strong interest in finding diplomatic and other peaceful means to, to resolve uh, international differences. So they, they have a very strong stake in this. And, that's, and, and the developing countries have been in a very vulnerable situation especially at, at the end of the Cold War, where there was no longer any incentive to try to entice friends in the developing countries by providing aid and so on. So aid has gone down uh, to developing countries. And even the new commitments, for example, relating to climate finance have not, have, have, have not been met. Uh, and there was a promise of a significant increase in climate finance from the year 2020. Nobody even talks about it these days in, in Europe. And then what, what do we see? Two years ago, um, almost two years ago, uh, there was a promise to get rid of coal. And right after the Ukraine war begins, uh, Germany is going back to coal. You know, uh, I mean, this is a, a world where developing countries feel that they have very little voice, nobody is paying much attention, and that they are the vi- victims of this changing international rivalries. And so they have a strong vested interest they don't want to be part of either camp. Uh, they don't. They have no particular interest in aligning uh, 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 with with uh, with Russia 
or, or China or, 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 or Iran. Uh, but um, uh, so, so they, they would prefer to be non-aligned. And that space to recognize a, a third space for non-alignment is something which is very important, which both sides, uh, both protagonists uh, in, in the, both sides uh, in the current uh, Cold War, if you will, uh, have to uh, appreciate and recognize. And, and so, and, and this is particularly important because one of the other casualties of the uh, unipolar world after the end of the first Cold War was the decline of multilateralism. Multilateralism, as a former UN civil servant, I, I, can, I can attest to this, multilateralism has had a very, very rough time of, for more than three decades. Developing countries have a strong vested interest, you say, not to be part of either camp of uh, international rivalries in the new Cold War, Cold War 2.0. Do you think then uh, that, among other things, this could have a democratizing effect on the UN? I think one of the big problems right now is where is the leadership going to come from? The leaders of the non-aligned movement who first met in 1961, but there was a, pre a, pre a precedent for before that in Bandung in 1955. Uh, there are no more such leaders in the world today. And this is a, a hugely problematic. Uh, but it's precisely because of that that you can have much more democratic arrangements uh, for, for a new non-aligned movement uh, pe with people from relatively more smaller countries. Uh, if you think, for example, of the Prime Minister of Barbados and you think about some of the other people who have provided extraordinary leadership in, this, in these new times, um, you know, I, I, you, we would have a much more participatory uh, 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 um, and democratic arrangements within the non-aligned movement, which would in turn have an influence on the United Nations. With respect to efforts to democratize the UN, comment on the defunding of multilateralism. In other words, do you see this as a serious problem for the more democratic fora within the UN? Yes, this is a very, very major problem where, you know, uh, organization after organization within the UN system, and I'm talking about the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and a, a, a UNIDO and so on, um, have, uh, have faced a situation where they, if they, if they do what they're supposed to do, they are deprived of funding and are in, unable to operate. And, uh, you know, this, this has become a pattern. So, for example, uh, the US and uh, the UK and a couple of other countries pulled out uh, of UNIDO, the uh, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and a whole variety of other institutions have been held hostage by rich countries. So the result has been many of these institutions, they are grossly, grossly underfunded. And, and the member states themselves are complicit because they do not are not prepared to come up with the fund, for alternative funding. So the, the, the organizations uh, make com all kinds of compromises. So you have a situation where um, the powerful corporate interests have been able to take advantage of this and sneak in their agenda. And to advance their agenda, the go-to mechanism for powerful corporate interest has uh, proven to be the World Economic Forum type multi-stakeholder arrangements. So it's not surprising to see the WEF listed in the US-led big power block uh, uh, presented in your lecture. I'm thinking here of your visual showing NAM 2.0 plus G77. So the current non-aligned countries plus the group of developing countries versus the G7 plus NATO plus OECD plus WEF. With respect to this big power block, I quickly note for viewers that these WEF type multi-stakeholder arrangements place corporations at the center of decision making over public goods and resources. So, uh, it's not so hard to understand why they're so well-funded. 
and why corporations and other elite interests that are not accountable to or elected by the public find this an effective vehicle for advancing their agenda in sector after sector. And why in sector after sector, from food and agriculture to big tech, health, the environment, education, you name it. Broad-based coalitions like, for example, the People's Working Group on Multi-Stakeholderism have called this out as the corporate takeover of global governance. And also a special relevance to today's conversation, in this case, with respect to the G7 and OECD. I'll briefly cite some award-winning research published in 2000 by John Braithwaite and Peter Drahos. I refer to their discussion on forum shifting, uh, discussed in Chapter 24 of their book, Global Business Regulation. Uh, The book, by the way, can be downloaded online. The issue is about how the post-Second World War U.S. reacted when it was not able to get multilateral agreement on what it wanted, so it did not get enough votes in the one country, one vote U.N. multilateral voting system. Or conversely, how the U.S. reacted when multilateral agreement was reached on what it did not want. A prominent example of the latter being the 1974 U.N. General Assembly adoption of the Declaration of the Establishment of a New International Economic Order, with UNCTAD having served as their technical advisor. Braithwaite and Drahos had this to say about how in the 1970s, the U.S. and other major powers reacted. In Chapter 26, and under the header, Recapturing the Sovereignty of the People, they wrote, quote, When UNCTAD became a more genuinely democratic force for a new international economic order, where developing countries could use their superior numbers to win votes, they set up the G7, to make the major coordinating decisions on the international economic order. Shift trade policy to GATT, an investment tax and competition policy to the OECD, and consolidate the G10 as the dominant forum on banking. Meanwhile, UNCTAD languished as a talk shop with dwindling budget and clout. This is the lesson of Chapter 24 on forum shifting, as a fundamental strategy of potent players, end quote. The UN General Assembly has since made valiant efforts to realize its potential as a more genuinely democratic forum. Given your direct involvement, I'll cite one such effort in 2008. This was when the president of the UN General Assembly established a high-level commission to propose reforms in the world financial system aimed at preventing a financial crisis like that of 2007-2008. You served not only as a member on that commission of experts chaired by Joseph Stiglitz, but as advisor to the president of the UN General Assembly in your capacity as UN Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development, UNDESA. So, As a veteran diplomat in the world of multilateralism, perhaps you could help uh, us make sense of all this into the present. The United Nations, unfortunately, will continue to remain uh, uh, captive uh, to the the big powers. But insofar as it offers a moral force, it can provide leadership uh, in an extraordinary period. So the, the period you referred to, Lynn, is, is a very important period because in 2008, precisely because of that, uh, the UN was able to sit uh, in and influence uh, quite a number of important uh, uh, decisions, but it really depended on friends of the UN, uh, including uh, big powers at that time. So these big powers uh, who had particular reasons for, for favoring us or turning to us uh, allowed us to have this kind of influence, which was important. And so for the first time, and perhaps the last time for some time to come, uh, we were able to influence the discussion. Uh, our slogan of a, of a global Green New Deal as a way of addressing that crisis uh, was largely taken up 
I still remember Prime Minister Gordon Brown calling up the Secretary General and saying that he wanted to talk to the Secretary General about his opinion, editorial, and so on. And and uh, and we were able to 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 shape the discourse. Unfortunately, of, of course, as we know, that uh, Gordon Brown was very successful in raising money, but most of it, as we know, went to strengthening the IMF, and not even for the purposes of helping developing countries, but really for helping the pigs uh, as they as they encountered their own problems uh, at the beginning of the last decade. So we have a situation where. Of course, you know, um, you know, uh, it's it's never a simple process of making this uh, steps forward. But you know, this this is this this was important, and also very importantly, there was a recognition of some of the problems of financialization, and the United Nations system, including colleagues at UNCTAD and so on, uh, recognized this, and we were able to to uh, influence the discussions and some of those decisions. Unfortunately, that that moment turned out to be quite fleeting, and, uh, uh, and people uh, uh, informed me that that uh, that although there's a lot of lip service is still given to the UN, uh, the UN is not party, uh, is not is not really at the main table when it comes to these discussions. But your point about the G7 being created, it actually, as you remember. It was the G5 which was created, and then to strengthen the Anglophone side of the G5, they added uh, Canada and Australia, and that it does, thus it became the G7, and and uh, so so this all this um, was 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 very important at a particular moment in time, uh, but the very fact that there there was felt there was a felt need to for the G7 to be created uh, um, is is, uh, in a sense, a testimony to the significance of 1974 and the new international economic order. Uh, many years later, when the, when the global financial crisis happened, as you know, the status of the G20 also was became elevated. The G20 began meeting for the first time at the summit level, not just among finance ministers as, as at, at the outset. And so, you know, so it's usually it's never a straightforward uh, prog- path of progress. It's zigzaggy, and you know, it's one step forward, uh, sometimes one step, two steps backwards, and two steps forward, one step back. But that that unfortunately is the very nature of progress uh, at the international level, especially when you have the big powers uh, basically calling the shots. Uh, that there have been some very very interesting recent developments, as you know. Um, including, for example, uh, uh, a great deal of of, uh, of talk, uh, some of it exaggerated in my view, about de-dollarization, and and uh, you know, and that how the BRICS uh, might lead this. One has to remember that the BRICS are are, uh, are, uh, are a changing bunch of 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 of, of countries. Uh, we know what happened with Bol- with uh, Bolsonaro when Bolsonaro was president, and so on and so forth. Now there is a proposal to include even more countries, and this might be interesting. But the very act of having a, a, an organization of relatively big countries basically keeps out the smaller countries, and so you, you are likely to lead. Uh, this is likely to lead to some degree of alienation and division. Uh, among the de- developing countries, and that's why I believe that it is important for the non-aligned movement to reconvene on a new basis, on a pacifist basis, and on a basis which recognizes that we are not in a situation of fighting ideological and political battles of the first Cold War, but rather we are in a battle for the future of humanity itself, for the you know for the ability of humanity to survive. Uh, not only in terms of uh, not only in terms of, of sustainability of but also in terms of the avoidance of war and strengthening the institutions to 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 uh, to avoid war as well as strengthening the UN as an institution to avoid war I'd like to briefly touch on your thoughts about strengthening the UN as an institution to avoid the other major existential threat to humanity that 
of climate change. And as you said at the open, there is a lot more attention uh, being given to the long-term problems of sustainability because of the growing recognition of global warming. And I specifically want to touch on the issue of long-term sustainability as it applies to food and agriculture, given the current system is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, and because it's an area of expertise where you have a lot of experience. So in your high-level position at the UN Rome-based Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, and into the present as a member of the IPES Food Experts Panel, you've been a major advocate of agroecology. And the case for agroecology, as I understand it, is quite compelling. In short, the agroecological-led farming and food systems are a win win, win uh, for moving the world towards long-term sustainability in terms of the environment, the production of food, and also the livelihoods of millions of people throughout the world, most notably people in developing countries that, as you explained earlier, have been left in a very difficult situation. And what comes across very clearly in all this is your position that agroecology should be given a lead role in agenda setting over the future of food at the UN. So what then uh, do you think is needed now that could possibly move things in that direction? But I think one of the major challenges going forward as far as agroecology is concerned uh, is to do what the people have done with the IPCC. The IPCC let's face it, is actually uh, produces these documents which are compromised documents. Compromised in the sense that those who are, who are very concerned, for example, about the likelihood that uh, you know, the, the way things are going, we're going to exceed the upper limits which the UN FCCC has established of one and a half degrees Celsius uh, within, within, within a couple of decades. Okay, so there is a real concern that all this is going to happen, but we can't get the momentum going. But what the IPCC has successfully done has been to warn the world. And it's since the intergovernmental panel, nobody challenges them in a fund, in a, in, you know, everybody is sort of recognizes that it's a compromised document, but its credibility remains largely intact. And th this is what is needed right now to rescue the future of food and agric food agriculture, especially from uh, the clutches of the corporate of the of, of agribusiness and the agrochemical companies. This is this is how I would see this as possibly uh, uh, of getting out of the situation, the mess we are in. And you know, it's left to the Secretary General as to whether he would he he, he will exercise that kind of leadership. Um, and uh, the director general of the of the food and agriculture organization is not averse to it, but he wants to keep the organization together. And so the government representatives at these meetings will need to insist on an intergovernmental uh, panel rather than an in, than, than one of these so-called multi-stakeholder arrangements where the corporations come and take over simply because they have all this all this money with them. Jomo KS, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And from GPE News Talks, coming to you from Geneva, Switzerland, thank you for joining us.